My name is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC ECHO. Welcome to this week's session, and I will turn it over to today's speaker. Thank you all for having me. So today I'm going to give a brief update on non-AIDS-defining malignancies. In the future, I'm happy to chat about AIDS-defining malignancies or some of the hematologic issues that are prevalent among our patients with HIV. I, so I have no conflicts of interest to, to disclose. I know that slide went pretty quickly. My hope for today is to describe the epidemiology of non-AIDS-defining malignancies, to characterize treatment factors which affect outcomes among HIV-infected patients, and then briefly touch on cancer prevention, including one of the clinical trials that we have available here at Harborview, but also at various sites around the country. The relationship between hematology oncology and HIV medicine is really from the beginning of the epidemic when, as you all know better than I, it really was the detection of both KS and uh, PJP, but KS relevant to um, oncology that heralded the, the start of this, this epidemic. In the initial WW, uh, MMWR by the CDC in July of 1981, it described 20 patients who presented with KS and described some of the epidemiology, and it really triggered, as you all know, the further investigation and characterization of this virus. And in fact, in fact, since that time, the number of persons who have been living with AIDS has dramatically increased in large part, obviously, through the, the use of effective antiretroviral medication. This met, this uh, this graph is an illustration from a recent New England Journal of Medicine article which highlighted specifically the role of AIDS malignancies with among patients living with HIV and AIDS. And the co-authors of this are Dr. Yarchuin and Dr. Aldrich, who are both at the NIH at the time. Dr. Aldrich actually is now part of our faculty at the University of Washington and the, the Fred Hutch. But as you can see, it, there's been a dramatic increase in the number of persons living with AIDS. The cancer among AIDS, fortunately, has uh, declined. The yellow graph, part of the bar graph that you see, are the AIDS-defining cancers, and I'll describe what those are on, in a few slides. But as you can see, over time, early in the epidemic, the majority of cancers that we saw were the AIDS-defining cancers. And over time, the proportion of the AIDS-defining cancers and the non-AIDS-defining cancers has really changed, such that the epidemiology now indicates that it's the non-AIDS-defining cancers that are, are becoming increasingly common. 1996, as you all again know better than I do, was the introduction of protease inhibitors, and that really, with improved immune function, really changed the, or turned the switch between the AIDS-defining malignancies and the non-AIDS-defining malignancies. So overall, the combination of HIV with cancer dramatically increases risk, up to 3,000 times excess risks of certain cancers, and it, it, is, it remains a leading cause of death. There's an estimated 8,000 cases annually of cancer in general among patients with HIV, and this is approximately a 50% increase over the expected number in the general population. So we characterize cancers typically as AIDS-defining cancers and non-AIDS-defining cancers, and some of that distinction is really a historic distinction. Initially, the start of the outbreak Kaposi sarcoma, certain subtypes of non-Hodgkin lymphoma, but not necessarily all, and cervical cancer were, uh, in combination with a diagnosis of HIV, made the designation of AIDS. And notably, each of these three are caused typically with another cancer-causing virus, whether it's HHV8 for Kaposi sarcoma, EBV, or um, HHV8 for certain non-Hodgkin lymphomas, or HPV for cervical cancer. Notably, the, the risk was dramatically increased for these certain cancers up to you know, 1,500 times, but the, the cancer that actually had the highest es excess risk at the start of the epidemic and even to date really is anal cancer, but that was not part of the initial diagnosis of, uh, to meet the AIDS definition. For the non-AIDS-defining cancers, the ones we think about are anal cancer associated with uh, HPV, liver cancer in part associated with uh, hepatitis B and C, Hodgkin lymphoma with EBV, and lung cancer.
And lung cancer is uh, in part due to other risk factors, including the increased prevalence of smoking. We see it quite commonly. And in fact, lung cancer, for and we don't know the biology, but lung cancer presents typically years earlier than it does in HIV uninfected patients, and this has some potential implications for screening. So even given, uh, if you control for tobacco years, lung cancer appears earlier for those patients who are infected with HIV. The AIDS-defining cancers are more commonly seen shortly after a diagnosis, whereas the non-AIDS-defining cancers are more typically seen five plus years after the initial diagnosis. This graph, which is from a few years ago, but it, uh, the numbers are generally the same, shows the standard incidence ratios of these various uh, malignancies. So uh, the risk for KS is 1,300 times uh, a non-HIV infected patients. The risk for primary CNS lymphoma, 250 times for systemic lymphoma, 10 to 15 times, and three times for cervical cancer. And you can see the respective, the respective numbers for the non-AIDS-defining malignancies. Right now, uh, really, it's in terms of the, the number of cases, lymphoma is the, the primary diagnosis, uh, or the most common diagnosis that we see among patients, and then followed by KS, but this has geographic variation. Part of the work we do here is we work with colleagues in Uganda at the Uganda Cancer Institute where uh, that relationship was initially started because of one of uh, our colleagues uh, in infectious disease, Corey Casper, and um, one of his mentors, Larry Corey, were, in this, uh, were interested in Kaposi sarcoma. And so given the effective use of antiretrovirals in this country, the prevalence of KS dramatically decreased, but unfortunately its prevalence is still remains high in sub-Saharan Africa, and it's the most common cause of, of cancer in, uh, or our leading cause of cancer in Uganda. And so the research platform that we have with Uganda was really uh, started because of, uh, of KS. This is a recent article that shows the excess cancer burden among HIV-infected population, and it's stratified, or it's separated by the different HIV risk groups. And uh, there is some variation in terms of the different types of cancers by the HIV risk group. So uh, men who have sex with men, the excess cancer cases that we see for non-Hodgkin lymphoma are nearly a thousand, so, you know, quite prevalent. Same with KS and same with uh, anal cancer, they, those three really are the 80% uh, of the excess cancer burden that we see for patients with, uh, with HIV. So why is there this associated uh, increased incidence? Well, there's probably a number of different factors. One is immune dysregulation, which allows for impaired immunologic control of other oncogenic viruses, whether it's HHV8, HPV, or EBV, and then immune exhaustion such that it causes an uh, um, sort of exhausted T cells that aren't properly able to fight off the infection. And we're learning more about this when, because one of the um, new areas in oncology is the use of immunotherapy, and it really highlights the role of the immune system both in immune surveillance but also in, in terms of treating malignancies. There's also a role for chronic antigen stimulation by these viruses, cytokine dysregulation, potentially proliferative signaling pathways that are triggered, which can lead to angiogenesis. And then for lung cancer, clearly the, the smoking prevalence is one of the, the risk factors. This is an article from The Lancet from a few years ago that shows the cause of death over time among patients uh, with HIV. And initially, again, the dark blue um, bars on the bottom for each column, and each column is, um, the column on the left is the total, but then each uh, subsequent column is a year. So from the first columns are from 1999 to 2000, and the ones on the far right are more recent between 2009 and 2011. The columns in the dark blue include AIDS-related deaths, and this would encompass, again, the AIDS-related malignancies. And you can see that proportion of all deaths earlier in the epidemic was quite high relative to other causes, including the causes in light blue, which are the non-AIDS-related cancer. Now, um, more recent times, 
it's the non-AIDS defining cancers that are um, a larger cause of, of death among patients and then other causes including uh, cardiovascular disease. And this is by viral load, the same pattern is consistent over time. And these are patients who, even with the viral load less than 400, the, the numbers of age-related cause of death, including those cancers, has decreased, but the, the non-AIDS-defining cancers has really remained relatively steady during that, that time period. And this is a recent article from a colleague who used to be at the Fred Hutch, Anna Coghill, from a few years ago, and it shows the mortality rates when you compare, it's hard to, to see, but for each area where there's a potential malignancy, it's the plus is for HIV infected and the minus is for HIV uninfected, and really you can see for when you compare the two bars side by side, really for every malignancy that's documented here, the mortality rate is substantially higher um, both the cancer-specific mortality and the HIV-specific mortality when compared to, well, obviously not the HIV-specific mortality, but the cancer-specific mortality is substantially higher among patients who are HIV-infected. And there's a couple of different reasons for that. One is there's disparities in care. We know from, from data that HIV-infected patients with cancer have higher, higher mortality for a variety of reasons. One, their diagnosis is delayed. Two, they present at an advanced age. Three, the immunosuppression as a result of their HIV or AIDS-related complications may impair therapy. And then four is the lack of appropriate treatment, whether that's, uh, and that's independent of other factors, insurance status or comorbidities. There's also some provider concerns about how best to treat patients who, are H who have concurrent HIV and cancer. These patients, unfortunately, historically have been excluded from participation in clinical trials, so we don't know fully whether the results from clinical trials can adequately be generalized to patients who are HIV infected. infected. Historically, there have been a lack of cancer treatment guidelines to help guide the administration of, of chemotherapy. And then finally, there have been concerns about uh, whether it would be too toxic to, uh, to uh, to prescribe both antiretroviral therapy and chemotherapy concurrently, especially with regard to bone marrow suppression. So they've looked at, for uh, 46 new drug applications, these are cancer-related drugs, and uh, for their clinical trials, and really there were no trials that specifically included patients who are HIV infected, and the majority of trials specifically excluded patients who are HIV infected. Now, given the improvements in care, it's definitely uh, increasingly recognized that we do need to do a better job of modernizing clinical trial eligibility criteria such that the diagnosis of HIV is by itself not an exclusionary criteria. We're trying to do that. There is a clinical consortium that I'll talk about in a second called the AIDS Malignancy Consortium that specifically enrolls patients who are HIV positive but we're also trying to have language to include patients who are uh, in clinical trials independent of their HIV status if they have well-controlled disease. We also now, in the past, there have been a lack of guidelines for how to treat patients with cancer. Much of cancer therapy is uh, very algorithmic. And now, in a lot of the guidance we have is from the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, or the NCCN. And uh, starting this year, we actually now have guidelines for how to better treat patients who have cancer and, uh, and HIV. One topic that I'll just briefly talk about because it has a role in prevention is anal cancer. The incidence is rising. Risk factors, as you all know, include HIV, HPV, smoking, and uh, higher among men who have sex with men. 97% of the anal cancer burden among people living with HIV AIDS was in excess. And 83% of that excess of those excess cases occurred among men who have sex with men, and that was to the graph that we showed earlier. And much of this is among patients who have been living with HIV for at least five years. And anal cancer, similar to cervical cancer, it develops from a precursor lesion. It goes from a um, non-invasive pre-malignant disease to a malignant disease. The histology is typically squamous cell, 
and we typically treat it with chemotherapy, standardly 5-fluorouracil plus mitomycin chemotherapy with radiation. Typically the chemotherapy is given um, in the beginning and uh, at the end. And so we have a prevention trial just like cervical cancer. We know that uh, cervical cancer incidence and mortality have dramatically decreased probably by 75% or more since the widespread introduction of pap smears. And so the thought was, well, maybe a similar type of prevention could affect the morbidity and mortality from anal cancer. And so this is a trial that we have at Harborview and other uh, sites that's called the ANCHOR trial, the Anal Cancer Among HCL Outcomes Research Study. In Seattle, it's offered at Harborview, Virginia Mason, and the Poly Clinic, and really it's a multi-centered phase three randomized trial with a target enrollment of over 5,000 uh, men and women to answer the question, does treatment of precancerous lesions prevent the development of anal cancer? And so patients are monitored uh, either actively with no treatment of the precancerous lesions or they receive treatment of the precancerous lesions. So they will have an anal pap smear with uh, um, high resolution anoscopy with biopsies. They have every six months they'll have an anal pap smear and HRA. The active monitoring group gets biopsy. The treatment groups gets uh, local therapy, either with a topical chemotherapeutic agent, electrocautery, or a surgery. And there's some patients are paid $100 per visit. It's open to men and women who are HIV positive greater than 35 years of age. And we're hoping to see its effect on the development of invasive anal cancer. And so, that is one hope that we have to prevent cancer among patients who are HIV positive. We know that early diagnosis and treatment with antiretroviral is preventative. Both the Centers for Disease Control and the NCCN now have a recommendation for universal testing. So anyone who comes into a cancer center who does not have a known diagnosis should get tested for HIV, and we're trying to standardly implement that now. The risk of cancer is reduced, we know, among those who initiated uh, ART with a CD4 count greater than 500 compared to those who initiated at a, a lower CD4 count. And there's a, with this, there's a 50% reduction in both the non-AIDS defining cancers, a 90% reduction in KS, and a 70% reduction in lymphoma. Vaccinations clearly are preventive, HPV and HPV, smoking cessation, and then age-appropriate cancer screening. So just to summarize, patients with HIV are at increased risk. Disparities are still persistent, unfortunately. And most patients who develop cancer really should be offered the same cancer therapy as HIV-negative individuals, including participation in clinical trials as able. And importantly, patients should be co-managed both with an oncologist and an HIV specialist to really monitor the, the treatment and the the medications that are necessary.